That's what I like. That's what I like, a short introduction. It's good news. You know, you're a very genial group. This is very pleasant. Uh, sometimes I'm, I'm greeted with a pretty severe looking group. And, you know, under, considering the changes and the shifts that are going on, this is very good news. There's a, there's a nice atmosphere here. You know, um, I really want to add value, value to your meeting. This is what I want to do. I want to give you something. Otherwise, why should you spend the next 50 minutes with me? Oh, no. 50 minutes. 50 minutes. Uh, I believe that uh, talking to a, a group of uh, any group is a responsibility. It, it weighs heavily on me. I, I, I want to do well for you. I really do. And uh, it's, as I've been sitting here listening to all the stuff you're talking about, it's quite clear that I know nothing whatsoever about your business. So what can I do? I mean, these acronyms uh, blow me away. But of course, I have work, I've done work for Ford, so I know that you're acronym uh, adept. I think any uh, opportunity to talk to a group is a privilege, and it is a responsibility. You've had a lot of specialized information thrown at you today. Uh, and as I said, I've already said, I want to add value, I want to be useful. Now, although I've had some business experience, uh, building a business from scratch, uh, 50 million is quite a small business, but it was a, a healthy business. There were 150 people there with all of the joys, trials and tribulations of 150 employees. Um, I can't talk specifically to your, your business, your nuts and bolts. I'm certainly not an engineer. I'm not going to admit to having been involved in marketing because I could I can feel the overtones here about that group. Okay. What I can do as I share my, some mountaineering experiences with you is to recommend an attitude. That's what I want to leave you with, an attitude. A particular point of view that you might want to bring to your business and your personal life. It's an attitude that I've found helpful. It's a framework, if you like, on which to hang all the stuff, you know. Okay, let's go searching then, if we will, for an attitude. Almost three years ago, I celebrated my 68th birthday with four companions at Camp 2 on Everest, 21,300 feet high. Although we were tucked inside a tent that was large enough to contain a, a propane heater, we all wore uh, down clothing and we ate our food eating uh, heavy gloves. The, the constant cold uh, and the, the lack of oxygen had caused my fingers, all of our fingers, to split into quarter inch deep cuts. So we'd used crazy glue, you know the stuff you stick the cars together with, I understand, to push the flesh together. You just had to make quite sure you didn't touch the fingers. Okay. The following day, we planned uh, to spend about eight hours climbing the Lhotse face, which leads up to Everest. This is a 45 degree ice slope. It's, it's not technically difficult, but where a single careless moment, uh, a single mistake, sends you on a very rapid 2,000 uh, foot trip to a sure and certain death. This has happened even to uh, experienced Sherpa guides. We did know it in our tent that evening, but one of our own guides would, uh, one of our own Sherpas would fall to his death from the summit ridge. And of course the question is, why? <laughs> why? Why expose oneself to the discomforts of high altitude mountaineering, uh, let alone the very real dangers of pulmonary oedema, that's where you drown with the fluids in your lungs, or even more fun, cerebral oedema, where there's so much fluid in the head that you go crazy. Why would one do that? Hmm? And what has that got to do with your business, your daily life here? That's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about the value of adventure and the rewards of risk. Hmm? The value of adventure and the rewards of risk. I am uh, going to offer a thought or two about things that I've discovered in over 50 years of hiking and climbing around the world. But please, please don't think I'm giving advice. I've got six children and ten grandchildren, so I know exactly what happens to advice. <laughs> and I'm, I'm certainly not going to presume 
to tell you how to run your business life. I haven't a clue what you do day by day by day. Doesn't that sound useless? But I think this attitude might be helpful. Simply pick up anything you think might be useful and ignore the rest, okay? Now, at the end of my presentation, I'm going to ask you to do some work. But again, I'm not going to be telling you what to do. That's your decision. Now, I suspect that you've already guessed that you are going to uh, be subject to a lot of mountaineer, mount, mountains today, this afternoon. And that's true. But if mountaineering is not your thing, if it doesn't appeal to you, just remember, every time I talk about my mountains, please replace that with your passion, your own goal. You, you do have a passion, I hope. You have a passion? Good. Now, if you're as smart as I, I think you are, you're still saying, yeah, yeah, aha. Uh -huh. But I wonder what Leslie's up to. I wonder what he's really trying to sell us. Hmm? I mean, I've already told you I've been involved in marketing, so you know there's not much trust floating around about that one, right? What's he up to? And the answer is simple. I believe it's a very good thing to actively work on developing an adventurous attitude to our business and personal life. I, I believe that it's important to take reasonable and some unreasonable risks, since life itself is one long adventure. If you don't push the limits, if you don't make your life into a full face into the wind adventure, you're less likely to be lucky and you're in serious danger of being bored to death. And being bored to death is a terrible way to die. Now, I, I, I'm not suggesting that immediately after this meeting is over, you, you go to the airport and uh, buy yourself a ticket to Kathmandu. I don't believe that uh, anyone needs to climb Everest or any mountain. But I do believe that it's a very good thing to think and to ask yourself, am I being adventurous enough? Is there any adventure in my life? Adventure. Now, what does that mean? A fun trip? And, you know, I'm going off on an adventure? Hey, uh, big surprise. Let's talk about adventure. When I looked it up in the dictionary, I was surprised. It doesn't mean an exciting trip or a fun experience. The word adventure means risk, hazard, chance. And if you look up the word risk in the OED, the Oxford English, you'll find that the first definition is adventure. <laughs> Interesting thought. In a true sense of the word, an adventure actually means an accident, something unexpected. That's what it means, okay? Now, I think it's important to realize that no matter how carefully we prepare, uh, no matter how thorough our plans, and how careful our backups, and goodness knows, people at Ford know about that whole scene. Adventure is what happens when you least expect it. So remember, the word adventure means the unforeseen, the totally unexpected. Okay? Once again, it, of course it's important to plan, but the real name of the game, I believe, is learning how to respond rapidly and intelligently when things change and they will change. Do I need to tell you that? <laughs> like teaching my grandmother to suck eggs, you know that. <laughs> 30 years ago, a few buddies and I were uh, traveling in a beaten up old four-wheel drive uh, vehicle along a ravine in Afghanistan. On one side was this sheer rock, and on the other side, 18 inches away, was this rushing river just waiting to carry us away. No problem, it was a road. <laughs> It became a problem when it stopped being a road. But again, no problem. We're full of that good old explorer spirit, we kind of spent the next three hours rebuilding the road, only to turn a corner 15 minutes later to find that this time there was no road. Everything got unpacked, loaded onto donkeys and onto our backs, and we started hiking 100 miles. That's an adventure. Adventure is what happens to a venture. And when adventure strikes, you quickly learn to be flexible. Now, Afghanistan sounds pretty exotic, but I got into that one purely by accident. I was 39 years old, and if you have time for questions, if you, you might ask me, why 39.40? What happened especially at around that time? If you, if you want to. 
I was 39 years old at the time, and I was having a, a quiet drink with a filmmaking friend in uh, a bar in uh, New York City, and he mentioned that a couple of his uh, friends in California were planning to mount an expedition to climb a 23,000-foot mountain in Afghanistan. Without giving it much thought, I uh, blurted out something along the lines of, wow, I've always wanted to get above 20,000 feet. That's the way we talked in the 60s, you know, wow. My friend said, well, why don't you give my, my buddies a call in California? I, mean, I think they could use an extra member and a couple of extra bucks to share expenses. I don't know quite why. I think I was in my second or third beer, but I, I got to, on the phone. And within three weeks, a very frantic and a very busy three weeks, I was on a plane to Kabul. And what a mind experience, mind-bending experience that was. I soon realized that I hadn't traveled 7,000 miles, I'd gone back in time some 2,000 years. This was my first experience of an Eastern market as we haggled over rice and uh, supplies. You know just the, the, uh, the, the weight on the scale? I think it's a bit of a car, isn't it? I mean, you know about these things. <laughs> okay. Watching these uh, women gathering firewood, which is a big, big problem in Afghanistan, you realize that you're a long way from home. Our truck bounced over 100 miles of desert through Yahalabad, which isn't there anymore, it's been blown to pieces, and then we went up into the ravines. And after loading our donkeys to carry our gear, that we began the long hike. Up and up we trekked, uh, and then we would settle down in the evenings on the lee side of a very large bonfire, feeling very comfortable, very relaxed, um, because our guides would sh throw strange sp uh, smelling weeds onto the uh, bonfire. It was the 60s. <laughs> we, uh, we went past these fortifications that had repulsed the British Army a hundred years earlier, and the occasional Af Afghani, often carrying a British Lee-Enfield rifle, which he'd probably taken from my great-grandfather in the Khyber Pass a couple of a hundred years ago. At this expedition was over 30 years ago, and uh, one of the local uh, uh, village elders told us with great pride that they had shot 12 climbers, Russian climbers, uh, the previous year. So we were rather careful about how we talked. Northern Afghanistan is a beautiful country. It was exciting to see the Himalayas, which I'd always dreamed about, getting closer every day. It's also something of a mind-expanding experience to see your dinner being carried live on the hoof in front of you, knowing that that was what you were going to eat that night. After hiking that hundred miles, we found our mountain. Pretty exciting thing, because there are no maps out there. And we began to figure out the best way to tackle the job. Now, expedition mountaineering is a continual learning experience, just like working for Ford, right? Uh, it involves constant decision making, since the situation changes often, and it changes rapidly. Especially after all our porters quit, we learned how hard it is to haul 60 pounds of gear at high altitude. Most extraordinary experience. You literally take three paces and you can hear your heartbeat going from 60, 70 up to 140 in your head. Thump, 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 thump. And when you stop, it goes down again. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a weird, weird experience. At uh, 20,000 feet, even getting up in the morning is quite an experience. You put one boot on, you go to the tent door and vomit, go back, lie down for 15 minutes, put the other boot on. With a bit of luck, within two hours, um, you're all roped up and ready to go. It takes you that much time to get going in the morning. Now, don't ask why does anybody put themselves through all this nonsense. Just look. I mean, we were just three weeks away from New York City. And after that three weeks of plodding, we were where we wanted to be, where we'd set our sights. And what a sight. Extraordinary place. Quickly plunging down those slopes that had taken us so long to climb, 
Uh, some of us did it in better style than others. <laughs> and after the long hike home, we lo loaded ourselves down with exotic and rather smelly coats in Kabul, said goodbye and uh, flew home. They cure these uh, coats um, with uh, sheep urine, so uh, <coughs> they, they do smell. Now, what did I learn? What did I learn by impulsively picking up the phone and what on earth could I tell you that might be useful? Well, for one thing, it confirmed something that I'd stumbled on uh, a few years earlier, which was that by saying yes to a situation, by following some genetic or learned tendency to push open any door that might be ajar, I would enlarge my experience and I would expand my self-knowledge and self-confidence. I learned a lot of things in uh, Afghanistan. Now, teamwork, for instance. Everyone assumes if you go on a mountain, everyone is a great friend and you come back a, 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 a coherent team. Not true. Usually you never want to see them ever again. <laughs> You've been sleeping with them, you know, for three weeks. Um, I learned that teamwork, as you surely know, does not come automatically just because a few fellows or women are thrown together in a challenging situation. There has to be absolute agreement about a common goal, a shared vision. That's the key. I learned that whilst mountaineering depends upon a team, it's also a very lonely business. No one's going to uh, pull you up the hill, and you better hope that no one has to cart you down. On a mountain, the minimum required to be a team member is not to be a burden on your buddies. So paradoxically, which happens to be my favorite word, paradox, paradoxically, you learn to look after yourself but the most important thing I learned from stumbling into this adventure, the really important thing was that at 40 years old, new doors had just opened. You see, when I made that phone call that led me to Afghanistan, I thought this was probably my last and only opportunity to climb a really big hill. After all, I was 40. I even called the film that we made once before I die, which shows you how limited my thinking was at the time. But having made the commitment and suffered through the, the effort to get to the summit, I learned that it wasn't that difficult. So new vistas opened up. And that's what adventure does, any kind of adventure. It expands our vision, it opens doors, it makes anything seem possible. You know, when I was a boy, my father said, he used to say, son, it's better to be born lucky than rich. And I think, that's a damn poor thing to say, you know. <laughs> I used to think it was a pretty dumb thing. But now I think that my dad was right. In fact, I have discovered, in this ripe old age, I have discovered how to be lucky. Would you like to know? Would you like to know? You won't be shocked, you won't be surprised, you'll be disappointed, but it happens to be the truth. The trick is to move. Physical movement. Physical movement, any kind of movement. You know, not much happens when we stand still, and even less when we're sitting down. Faced with a serious problem, you know, of course, it, when we have to make a difficult decision, of course it's important to think. But there's a very real danger, especially nowadays, that by the time you thought at every conceivable possibility, every, you know, everything through thoroughly, the whole situation will have changed. We only learn when we do something. That's how we get new information, by seeing things from a new point of view. Mountaineering and life are dynamic, they're dynamic games. Again, we don't learn very much just sitting around thinking about things, which is not a very encouraging thing to tell you at this particular moment, is it? But soon after that critical trip to Afghanistan, I started my own business, and that kept me pretty busy. But despite that, I made a point of always making time to climb.
always making time to do the things that drove me. I've hiked up Kilimanjaro, uh, which of course is the highest mountain in Africa, and it's really just a, 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 a seeming, it's a pretty, just a scramble, it's a long hike. Any reasonably fit person can get to the top of this mountain very easily, providing you take not the three days that the porters try to get you up there, but you take f five to seven days, no problem. And in 1995, I got to the top of McKinley, which at 20,000 feet in Alaska is the highest mountain in North America. And that was an experience. Climbing McKinley is the classic big mountain experience. I don't know whether you'll learn anything from me from McKinley, but it's intriguing. It involves hauling food and fuel across dozens of miles and up thousands of feet, pulling heavily loaded sleds and a backpack of 45 uh, pounds. Most teams that fail on McKinley have simply run out of gas, literally. Remember, you have to melt every drop of water you drink, so you have to carry a lot of fuel with you. Uh, they haven't planned enough food and fuel to cope with the unexpected because you can be locked down in a storm for three weeks. So paradoxically again, of course you do have to plan. It was on this expedition I had my first experience of sleeping in an ice cave. Now I had read and I'd somehow picked the idea up that sleeping in an ice cave or a, an igloo, your body heat warmed the place up. This is not true. <laughs> what we... What we were doing was simply uh, hunkering down in a deep freeze with a temperature set way below zero. But, but enough. You don't need to uh, have a litany of a blow-by-blow -blow description of what's involved in, in getting up McKinley. You just have to take my word for it. It's very exciting. It is very exciting to reach the summit, uh, feeling fit and knowing that one is standing on the highest spot in the whole of North America. And I won't try to describe how it feels. You just have to be there. 100,000 square miles of God's good country laid out beneath your feet. It's an amazing place to be. Just an amazing place to be. And after the obligatory photographs, uh, we got the heck out of there in one hurry, one big hurry. Everybody gets down off a mountain as soon as they possibly can. Uh, which is, of course, why most accidents happen on the way down, when everyone is relaxed and they're tired and they think the battle's over. It took just three days to get down all the way to the place that we'd started from two and a half weeks earlier. So we were moving fast. We dug up our beer, which we had thoughtfully cached uh, when the plane left us, and we waited for the plane. That's an interesting uh, uh, example of trust. You pay a man to fly you and dump you on a glacier and he flies away and there you are on your own and you say come back uh, in three weeks time and he says okay and then you sit down there and you wait <laughs> he needs to come because it's a long long way from Talkeetna by an extraordinary piece of luck my darling wife Barbara arrived at Talkeetna airport in time to greet her husband who uh, after just three weeks on the mountain was um, 15 pounds lighter, but one very happy fellow. So, back in New York. Oh, well, that's, that's over and done with, right? I have trouble with telephone calls because my guide called just uh, five months later and he said, hey, I'm putting together an expedition uh, to climb the highest mountain in Antarctica. Would you be interested? <laughs> what a lark. <laughs> Two really big ones in, uh, <laughs> in a single year. This was an easy yes. Uh, climbing Mount Vinson in Antarctica was an experience I'll, I'll never forget. The, the Antarctic, I knew nothing about it. It was just down south and cold. Um, it's a very, very big place. It's a continent larger than the whole of North America. And it's buried from over the whole lot in one mile deep of ice and snow. So as you fly over this great big blanket of snow, there are no valleys. You know, all you see uh, is the little peak sticking up from, uh, from underneath this blanket. Quite extraordinary place. Once again, <laughs> yeah, we were carrying heavy packs and pulling those children's sleds, those plastic sleds. 
Um, and because in summertime the sun never sets, there's 24 hours of sun, you just see the sun going around. <laughs> um, you, you, can, you can pull this silly thing for 12 or 14 hours, which makes for a very long day. But the, the big problem in the, the Antarctic is the constant wind. It it's blows all the time, and sometimes it gets to be very, very high. And you simply cannot survive a combination of high winds and extreme cold. So you climb, eat, and sleep in head-to-toe down clothing. You build an ice wall around your uh, camps to shelter the tents from the wind. And you never forget that you're one of a very small group, one of just five fellas, um, 200 miles from where the plane landed you, <laughs> okay, and uh, 3,000 miles from the nearest hospital. So you're kind of focused. At one point, the temperature dropped to somewhere between uh, 30 and 40 degrees below zero. At that temperature, all kinds of interesting things happen. Your food, your hot food, put into your plate, and it, immediately the, the vapor freezes around the edge of the, uh, of the dish. <laughs> you stuff calories down at every rest stop. Since it's almost impossible to consume the 8,000 calories you need a day to make up for the energy you're using. It's a great place to diet. 8,000 calories a day. I mean, this is a fun place. It's also a wild, scary place. But people only talk like that when they're giving talks like this because you've got to make it interesting. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, I love to climb these mountains. Why? Because you know you're alive. You cherish your life. And it feels fantastic. I mean, what a glorious day to stand on the highest point in this strange and lonely continent. This is what the word, word wonderful is, is really all about. Now, having climbed the three highest mountains on three continents, it was inevitable that my mind would turn to the really big one, of course. And in uh, 1997, I got my chance. Krakauer, he's the man that wrote this fascinating book called Into Thin Air. It's the story of the 1996 disaster. said that attempting to climb Everest is an intrinsically irrational act. Any person who would seriously consider it is beyond the scope of reasoned judgment, which is precisely the kind of encouragement I needed. Now, I, you know, it is true that more than 160 people have died on Everest, and uh, the odds for survival are, are not particularly good. At 26,000 feet, the amount of oxygen available is only 30% compared with sea level, and your physical performance drops precipitously. Every step really does become a major effort. You see films of Everest, and I'll show you some in a moment, and you look at so everybody's in slow motion. It's quite extraordinary. If you were brought to this altitude directly from sea level, if you took, we took you up just to 26,000 feet, forget the summit, and opened the doors, within seven minutes you'd be dead. So how on earth does one do this? It's, it's more fun than working. Uh, climbing through the Kumbu Icefall is a very dangerous hobby, since one has to climb up huge 60-foot high towers of ice. It's when the glacier tumbles over a high altitude, uh, high angle. They threaten to topple and fall every minute. Dozens of enormously deep crevasses must be crossed on rickety ladders. And one has to clamber through this uh, gauntlet at least eight times as you ferry the stuff up and down the mountain, up and down the mountain, during the acclimatization process. And avalanches are a constant threat. I lost two of my buddies on uh, just such avalanches. But all this death and talk of death and danger seems to me to completely miss the point. Everest is Everest. <laughs> I mean, these are the foothills. <laughs> it's a most extraordinary place. No mountaineer given the opportunity to climb this ultimate mountain could possibly turn it down. Certainly I couldn't. And for all this talk of death-defying danger, the truth is that ev climbing Everest is mostly very hard work. You're trying to stay healthy in a fundamentally unhealthy place, <laughs> made worthwhile by, I mean, this is a pretty good campsite. I mean, this is a nice place to be. Gloriously unexpected experiences. 
Part of the adventure of climbing Everest is Kathmandu. I mean, you have to spend a few days there getting your papers together. This is a weird place. I mean, for the moment you arrive there, you know that you're entering a very, very different world. I mean, it's a full, place full of these extraordinary temples and a, a world of holy men of all stripes and colors. The city is a, is a real eye-opener. It has a capacity to attack all your senses. You, you'd never be the same once you've gone through Kathmandu. I mean, they, they burn bodies by the side of the river. It's, it's a weird experience. And getting to the uh, base camp is also part of the experience, since it involves uh, hiring this Russian helicopter. I mean, there you go, you know, you kind of... Um, to fly 150 miles and five tons of food and gear, five tons of stuff, uh, 100 miles, 150 miles into the high country. And that's where you start your walk. Then we begin the 10-day uh, trek to base camp, crossing and recrossing the river, slowly gaining height uh, every day alongside these lumbering yaks and Sherpas carrying your stuff. 18 Sherpas and 12 yaks, and this is amazing, amazing place. I mean, if any of you like to hike, how would you like to hike uh, in this country? Mm. Wonderful vistas, wonderful vistas. Truly spectacular mountains, like nothing else in the world. They are so glorious that Barbara and I, we're going, uh, next year we're going to go on this walk just to get to base camp. It's an amazing experience. Then we finally arrive at uh, base camp, which is decorated with these Buddhist uh, prayer flags. As they flap, they, they, they pray. There were about 12 expeditions trying to climb Everest that year, and each one has its Sherpas, and they put these flags. So, so the whole place looks like a great big festival. It's like a fun fair. It's just great fun. Uh, climbing Everest is a long process, I've told you. It takes at least six weeks once you've got to base camp. So, you know, you have to set couple of couple of months aside. Much of the mountain has to be climbed four times, not only to establish four camps high on the mountains, but to acclimatize to the extreme altitude. First you climb this ice fall up to 19,500, but you don't go all the way up like that. Doesn't that look fun? No, no, no. You stay there overnight and you come down and rest for two or three days. And then you uh, go up to camp two, and you spend two or three nights there and come all the way down through the ice fall again and spend two or three days. And then you go up to camp three and then you come down to camp two and then you come down to base camp. And this process of climbing higher and recuperating uh, has to go on until your body has produced enough new additional red blood cells to carry the oxygen that's required to tackle the big push to the summit. If you ignore this process, you will surely die. It's that simple. Sounds biblical, isn't it? You will surely die. <laughs> okay. But before venturing into the ice fall, we have to have this Buddhist festival where we, it's like a, a holy communion, you know, you put wine and liquor on the altar and then you and bread, and then you eat it, and uh, it's great fun. And then you start your way through this ice fall. It's a long, difficult thing, but just look at the views. Just look at it. Imagine. When the clouds part and the sun shines through, it's wonderful. Yep, crossing those ladders wearing crampons is scary to watch. But in my experience, one is so utterly focused on putting one foot precisely <laughs> in front of the other, and not getting your crampons caught, you don't have any time to be scared. You're kind of busy. You don't have any time to be frightened. And this, of course, is one of the key benefits of any kind of adventure, climbing adventure or any kind of... It remarkably focuses the mind and eliminates all distractions. Somebody recently wrote in the New York Times that in a particularly dangerous situation, he said he felt jazzed. Now, he didn't mean thrilled or excited, he meant vividly alert. Um, he had a focus and clarity. He was imbued with inner strength so he didn't get scared. He felt um, physically strong. He said wariness gave way to vibrancy and he felt amazingly competent. This is what happens when we extend ourselves, when we push ourselves. 
These are some of the wonderful rewards of risk. Barbara says, the moment I put my boots on, at, even at home, you know, in New York, I'm putting my boots on, and she says, if you immediately start walking around in a macho way, you, know, you, almost, you look as if you suddenly become strong. <laughs> you, you know, <clears throat> remember that just like life, climbing Everest doesn't mean you spend most of your time hanging, you know, dangling over the edge of a precipice. It's mostly a slow, steady slog climbing higher and higher through good weather and bad until you reach the next camp. It's sort of like being on a Stairmaster all day. <laughs> and then you climb all the way back again and rest and you do it all over again. The fun bits, the risky bits, are usually quite brief. My seven-week attempt to climb Everest ended quietly at uh, Camp 3, over 24,000, uh, well over 24,000 feet into its infamous thin air. And uh, turning back was not a difficult decision. Quite simply, I didn't have the physical strength required. I mean, I was 68 at the time. Uh, my colleagues were all young enough to be my kids. Um, and although I was on oxygen, it was taking me too long to get from one camp to another. If I'd have tried for the summit, I would have been stuck as they were in 1966, coming down in the dark. That is not a good thing to do on Everest. This was not a disappointment, very peculiar. Um, I've always dreamed about being there, and I was. I'd always dreamed about seeing Everest since I was a kid. I'd read stories about it, and now I've been there. I've done things, and I've uh, seen things I've dreamt about all my life. So disappointment was no part of my Everest experience. Disappointment to me is when someone promises you something and doesn't deliver. No one promised me the summit. No one promised me the summit. Perhaps both men and women in the audience might be interested to learn that before I left for Everest, my wife Barbara said, um, you know, I want you to write down um, what you want to achieve, a sort of a vision statement. She's not dumb. Uh, she insisted that I do this and send a copy to my lead guide. Would you like to see that? It read, my objective on Everest is to climb as high as possible, perhaps even reaching the summit, but always keeping in mind that uh, returning safely to my loved ones must always be my first priority. I knew clearly what I was all about there. In other words, getting to the summit was optional, getting back was mandatory. Now, <clears throat> putting your goals down on paper, um, as the Harvard Business School will tell you, is a very good thing to do. It helps clarify your goals, and it greatly increases your chance of achieving them. 84 climbers got to the summit of Everest in 97, including three of our party, but nine people died including one of our party. So you need to know what the name of the game is. You need to know precisely what you're up to. A desperately cold moment when it's time to get out of a, a, the tent, a warm sleeping bag, and every move in the tent brings down a shower of uh, f frost down on you. A dozen times a day, it really happens, a dozen times a day you wonder, why am I here? Why am I subjecting myself to this? It's easy to forget the ecstatic moments. To wonder, how did I get here? <laughs> Look at it. Or the adrenaline high that you get coming down on a, a steep traverse. It's amazing, amazing experiences. And there's a very real sense that Bertrand Russell was right when he said, happiness is the full exercise of our capacity. Now, as you think about it, you've all had that feeling when it's working, <laughs> when you're pushing the limits in any area, and it's working. You're on top of your game. Briefly, it feels wonderful. It does feel good. It's very satisfying to know that you've done your best and discover that your best is far more than you thought, more than you imagined, that you've grown. I've learned so much on the high hills, and without moralizing too much, let's just flip through some of these things. What about the, the uh, importance of setting a goal? Now, oh, boy, this is such a 
corporate thing, right? Set goals. Well, it, it is satisfying to set a goal, make a plan to reach it, and then with a bit of luck, get where you plan to be. Um, and in just a few minutes, I'm going to ask you to think about uh, your goals, goals for all three corporations in your life. Uh, that, that's right, if you're still awake, all three corporations in your life, okay? But the real rewards of setting a goal is what one learns along the way, the accidents that happen. Meeting the unexpected, the gasp as you turn the corner to discover something you've... And even if what, you, you get to a point and you change your goals, all the time you have goals, you're moving. And all the time you're moving, you're learning. And that's when the fun happens. That's the exciting thing. After enough of these experiences, you begin to develop a special faith. It's almost a religious faith. You, you kind of a belief that no matter what fortune brings, it will be good. And that one way or another, you will cope and survive and thrive. It really is like faith. Good things happen when you, when you rediscover adventure. We become optimists. <laughs> you know, uh, no other philosophy works. It's that simple. Optimists may occasionally lose, but pessimists, by not entering the game, can't win. <laughs> so it seems to be pretty obvious, self-evident to me. Adventure also, perhaps most importantly, it helps us to overcome fear. Fear in the face of the unknown. Now surely by now you know that I'm going to say that as far as the future is concerned, everything is unknown. Hmm? Is that encouraging or is that subversive? Everything is unknown. Haven't you discovered that the thing that occasionally wakes you up at night and you toss and turn in bed, figuring out how to solve this problem and worrying, haven't you found out that that's not what happens? <laughs> it's always something that comes out of left field, good or bad. That's what happens. Our job as human beings, I'm sure, seems to me to be learning to deal with the unexpected, becoming comfortable with ambiguity, living with uncertainty, learning to walk or fly into an, an uncertain future, happy and confident that we can cope. That's what I think it's about. And the way to get there, I think, for myself, is deliberately exposing ourselves to adventure because it develops a kind of confidence and dispels fear. Let me take one more word or two, one more word or two about fear, if you don't mind. Fear. Fear. Fear paralyzes. This is an interesting picture. You get out of the, the, the great big uh, ex-army huge, huge tanker, this uh, Hercules, that flies from Chile, and it lands on the ice in the Antarctic. And he, he says, get out quick, I've got to get out of here. And so the five of you get out and you walk a mile over this ice. And he flies away. <laughs> great fun. Oh, I was talking about fear. Fear. Fear paralyzes. Fear turns us back into ourselves. It stops us being generous, outgoing, unafraid. We get into a fetal position when we get frightened. You know, when people are asked to quickly write down, don't think about it, just write down uh, things you're, fri that you're, you're frightened of. What do you think people write? I mean, fear of uh, fire, fear of drowning, fear of heights? No, the top of the list with any group of people is, <laughs> I'd rather die than speak in public. <laughs> now, think about it for a second. Why do people say, I'd rather die than speak in public? You know the answer. Fear of looking foolish. Hmm? Fear of exposing yourself. Who cares? Again, as my father used to say, you're a long time dead. You know, <laughs> you're, you're a lot less likely to worry about calling on a difficult prospect or trying something new or talking to Jack Nasser. If you've faced and conquered your own mountain, a real one, you know, uh, what's the worst that can happen? You can only die. And as you get older, it gets less important. 
I taught all my children to climb from the age of five. Well, that's actually not true. You don't teach children to climb. It's what they do naturally. Our job is to stop saying no. Our job is to encourage them, not tell them to stop. You, you know the root meaning of the word encourage? It means encour, to put heart into. Is that nice? To encourage. Okay. I also like the word enthusiasm. You know where that comes from? Entheos, like theos in theology, to put spirit into people. <laughs> nice idea? Nice idea. You know, right now in New York, they're uh, pulling the jungle gyms down. Why? Well, the kids occasionally fall and they you know, occasionally hurt themselves. The city is concerned with lawsuits and no one wants to see kids hurt, right? But how on earth else are our kids going to learn uh, to enjoy excitement and to make me and measure and evaluate risks? It was Helen Keller, of all people, Helen Keller who said, security is mostly a superstition. Life is either a daring adventure or nothing. And uh, the first, our children need to learn that truth. And Sir Edmund Hillary, the first person to climb Everest, said, it's not the mountain we conquer, but ourselves. As the kids would say, get over it. And T.S. Eliot pointed out the obvious. Only those who will go too far can possibly know how far one can go. Isn't that lovely? <laughs> but since I became a naturalized American, as you can tell from my American accent, my favorite quote on this subject is, you can't steal second base and keep one foot on first. Practice is the name of the game. Learning to be adventurous by being adventurous. Trying things, taking risks. Risk taking gets easier with practice. A word, if I may, uh -oh, about fitness. <laughs> Disgusting looking picture, but it introduces a disgusting subject. I think we shortchange ourselves if we don't do what we need to do to stay fit. I'm not talking about healthy, I'm talking about fit. Fit for what? Fit for life. Fit for life. Whatever comes our way, you need physical fitness. Now you say, yeah, 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 uh, before anyone starts moaning, oh, here it comes, you know, the lecture. Low-fat diet, lots of exercise, all that boring stuff. My dear friend, may he rest in peace, <laughs> Dr. George Sheehan, a cardiologist, the great uh, runner, he was right when he said that exercise is a bore and few people stick with it. Does that resonate with your experience? <laughs> Actually, he didn't say that. He said exercise lazy is a bloody bore and few people stick with it. The only thing that makes fitness worthwhile, the only way anyone ever sticks with exercise, is to set a goal. That's the trick. Once we make a commitment to climb a mountain, getting fit for the expedition comes naturally, because every day you're moving towards your goal. One reason I'm reluctant to break my habit of running the New York Marathon, I've run it for 25 consecutive years, <laughs> is it adds purpose to my perspiration. I would run every day, or five days a week, year in and year out, just to stay fit. <laughs> I've got other things to do. But around this time of the year, I think, uh-oh, <laughs> November the 7th is coming up. <laughs> hmm? It adds purpose to my perspiration. Something else that uh, George, Dr. George Sheehan used to say was, running, has no, running a marathon has no purpose but great meaning. And I think this has meaning perhaps in business. Think about this. At seven o'clock on a cold November morning, 400 buses drive 30,000 men and women all the way to the Staten Island Bridge. Hmm? You hang around there for about three hours, freezing your tail off, and then they fire a gun, and you run all the way back to where we started from. Now, I mean, that has no purpose. That's completely pointless, but it has great meaning. Every time I cross the finish line, I'm weeping. Last year, my eldest daughter and I crossed that line together. Great experience. 
great experience. The point is, of course, that we need a significant and meaningful goal in our lives to convert exercise from a bore to a great game, to an adventure. And it doesn't matter what it is. <laughs> All you need something is you'd, you'd really like to do something you've always wanted to do, scuba diving, running a marathon, perhaps windsurfing, or just keeping up with your grandchildren. You, we need some meaningful goal to make it worthwhile. That's so important. Put a mountain in your life and see what happens. And remember, I'm not talking about a physical hill. I am talking about something physical. I'm doing that. After all, it wasn't so long ago, dear friends, you know, four or five generations ago, and for the most people in this world today, you had to catch your dinner first. This whole, this whole, whole idea of buying it was a fairly recent idea. <laughs> if you didn't run, you died. <laughs> After I sold my company and uh, gave up active management, people began to ask me, especially in New York, Leslie, what do you do? What do you do? You know. I simply couldn't bring myself around to saying, I'm retired. It sounded like the end of a battle, you know. Uh, but now I've figured out a reply that seems to keep everybody satisfied. At least it shuts them up. I say, hey, my job is um, to take each one of my ten grandchildren away from their kids separately, one by one. Okay? Take them on a fantastic adventure, scare the living daylights out of them, bring them back safely, so that long since, I hope, when I'm pushing up daisies, they'll say to one another and to their children, you should have known my granddad. He was a pisser. Now, I think that the, this is an easy way to remember this, this talk. One word. Isn't that nice? You can remember this talk with one word. Hmm? If you want to remember this talk. That word is yes. I think it sums up the whole deal. I was traveling in New York City in the subway uh, a couple of years ago, and I spotted a poem about yes. I was so engrossed in writing it down on the back of an envelope that I went way past my stop. But, oh my, uh, what, a valuable, what a valuable thing it was to do that. Remember, you're in frantic New York City, you're on the subway, and this is what you read. Some go local, some go express. Some can't wait to answer yes. Some complain of strain and stress. Their answer may be no for yes. Some like, some like failure, some like success. Some like yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Open your eyes. Dream. Don't guess. Your biggest surprise comes after yes. Yes, the 30 years since I flew to Afghanistan have been very good years for me. To fit so many mountains into my life in addition to managing my business and it's been a great privilege. And, and I know how lucky I am. Am I? My wife and I, we thank the good Lord every morning, specifically, because we're so fortunate. But part of the reason I'm able to do these things is because that's the way I've lived. Emigrating to North America uh, 45 years ago with a wife, two small children, and uh, $15 in my pocket and no job. It's true. Leaving a secure job with Eastman Kodak, nobody ever left Eastman Kodak in the old days, ever. Along with all the other risky decisions that I chose to make or was forced to make, changes occurred, but I had to make a change, has become a habit. And I recommend that habit. I recommend that habit. Now, I uh, promised or threatened um, to give you some work. I promised this will only take five Five, eight, eight minutes, okay? Uh, you're a smart group of people, and you've been talk. I've heard the word vision, I've heard goals. I want to ask you questions, and I hope you're not going to be shy. Hmm? Is this a shy group? Uh, is it not a shy group? Well, we'll find out. Now, 
There isn't a soul here who doesn't know what a vision is, right? What a vision means. So would some of you like to tell me what a vision is? Define a vision. What's a vision? See, they are shy. No, thinking. What's a vision? Think about, very good, think about where you want to be. And because it's a uh, vision, because it's a kind of an optical word, seeing it, hmm? Is that okay, would they buy that? It's like, what would be a synonym? A dream? Is that okay? Now, you know, the word vision has been overdone. The reason I want to talk about a couple of words is I think it might be helpful. So a vision is a dream of where you'd like to be, where you'd like your team to be, your group to be, your company to be, your life to be, okay? Okay, then in that case, what's a goal? Ah, now, goals. Would you like to help me about goals? Targets along the way. Sorry? Targets along, the way. Targets along the way. Ah, pretty good. I must have said that before, right? What is what are the essence of, of a goal? What are the essential qualities? You want me to answer it then? Specific. Oh. Specific. It's got to have a time, a place. You know, I, you know, a marathon is not 14 miles or not 20 miles, it's 26 miles plus X yards. It, it, there has to be, it has to be a specific measurements of your dream. Hmm? And you know that, don't you? Why didn't you tell me? <laughs> it has to, you know, by a particular date, I will uh, increase my business 10%. Or by a particular date, hmm, I will get to a particular place. It has to be specific. Then comes the steps along the way. Huh? Now, I would like to talk to you about those three goals in your life. Or the three corporations. No, I don't want to talk about three goals. I want to talk about the three uh, corporations in your life. Now, you all work for Ford. Is that right? You all work for Ford. Uh, I, now I will, I will make your life easier. You don't have to respond. But you have to answer the questions in your own mind. Are you allowed to talk to yourself in this company? I talk to myself all the time. I think it's the essence of humanity. I often say, why am I doing this? <laughs> Isn't that right? I don't think animals talk to themselves quite that way. What, am I do what did I do that for? So, okay. I want you to talk to yourself on this one. How much time do you spend working for the Ford Motor Company? You don't have to answer me. Don't say eight hours a day. Everyone is working harder and harder. And you think about it at night and you think about it in the, when you're tra mm, traveling. You spend a lot of time. It's the center. It's central to your life. Hmm? No? Pretty much. So it kind of has to be. Now, I don't mean to be subversive, okay? The second corporation you work for is your family, your loved ones. Hmm? Those horrible words, significant other, spouse. No, 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 no. You know, the people you love. I have a very large extended family. How much time does one spend on one's family? Think about it. Now, look, don't, don't feel bothered. Um, you know, if you spend eight or twelve hours thinking on a whole and in general on a day working, thinking about your work, don't, don't be fussed that you may spend 15 minutes with your, uh, your loved ones. It's just a question of the quality of your thinking, your, the amount of care, okay? What on earth could be the third corporation? You've already guessed, haven't you? Yourself. How much time do you spend genuinely thinking about yourself? even as far as it can be, even separate from your family. We're born lonely and we die lonely. Uh, no, we don't. But you certainly you're born and you die um, in a very quiet place. Hmm? So how much time do you spend on yourself? Uh, as a, a, a doddering old retiree, you know, uh, I've... Uh, my current thinking is that from the age of about 30, you better start thinking about having a very full, rich life. Don't start at 65. <laughs> start building it up now. So there are three corporations in your life. Do you generally buy the idea? Hey, I tell you what, just for a lark, 
Just for luck, open the envelopes. What envelope? Now, friends, don't read the stuff. Just look at me for a second. Can you give me a second or two more time? This snap-out form has four copies. This is a Harvard Business Review deal. It's really high-level stuff, this is. Forget the mountaineering. This is really high-level stuff. There's, there's three... There's a red, white, and blue, sort of red, sort of white, and sort of blue, and a yellow one, right? Okay? Now, what I want you to do when I say go, <laughs> is I want you to write down um, a date. Do you see this? By a certain date, that's, that's making it a goal. In my business, and set any goal. Set a goal, you know? Don't let anyone see it. In my family, in my, you know? And then for yourself. Write down a goal. And here's the trick, look. When you've done that, you tear these apart, okay? And there are three envelopes, red, white, and blue. Guess what? Guess what you do with them? You put the red in the red, the white in the white, and the blue in the blue, right? And here's the good news. You seal it, because you wouldn't want any of your colleagues to, to read these things, would you? I mean, you know, that would be just scary. And you self-address them to your home address, okay? The three envelopes. And I'm told that you've got such a fantastic system here. They've, your good colleagues have promised, Harry has promised that in three months' time, you'll get the red envelope. And in six months' time, you'll get the white. And in nine months' time, you'll get the blue. So you will be reminded of your goals. Three months, six months, and nine months. And here's the trick, friends. You are far, be careful what you write down here, because you are very likely to gain those goals. So be careful what you wish for, okay? Now, if you do that, we can continue to chat for a while, you can ask a question or two. Um, why don't we just spend three or four minutes doing that? When you finish with these, with these uh, envelopes, on the way out, there's a young lady there, you just throw them into the tray, and they'll be sent to you, okay? If, if you will allow me to interrupt you just for a moment or two, please, if I might just stop you in mid-thrust, because unfortunately I have to leave in about 15 minutes, and it, I'm not going to take 15 minutes talking, you know, but you can continue this up. But let me just offer just two quick thoughts. Remember that this goal setting is not something you do and it's over and done with forever you might want to think about revising your goals every so often because it's a moving target, okay? A moving target. So that's one thing to think about. And uh, I, I do want, because I have been warned by my wife, and as you've already gathered, I, I listened to my wife very, very carefully. Here's a thought. She said to me, you know, Leslie, there will be people in the audiences that you talk to who will say, I don't want to climb a mountain. I don't want to, be f I, I don't want to do a, a deep sea diving. I don't want to do that kind of thing. Again, let me ask you a rhetorical question that you can answer. Have you not in each of your lives had, to, had an adventure? You've had to move from one place to another? Or you've made a decision? Haven't you all had some adventure in your life? And now the question is, has it worked out well for you? Has it worked out well for you? <laughs> because in my experience, when people do adventurous things, when they make bold moves, good things happen. But I'm not backing off from the fact that we are physical beings and a physical adventure is a pretty good idea. One final little story and I'm, I'm out of here. I'm a big one for surveys, okay? The saddest survey I ever read about was done at a nursing home. People within weeks or months or a year of dying, okay? And they were asked to write down what did they most regret about their life? Guess what the answer was? I should have taken more chances 
I should have been more adventuresome. Don't let that happen to you. Thank you, and God bless. <laughs>